Welcome to our talk, the place where we agree to disagree, if we disagree at all, that is. My guests today come from New Zealand. They're Peter Foster and Tanya Bat. Our topic is story and song. Hello to New Zealand. Hi there. Kia ora. That's a very nice thing you say there, Tanya. I never understood it. What does that mean? Uh, kia ora is uh, a greeting. It's uh, to do with um, aura is your well-being and your health. So um, wishing people um, good health, good well-being. But uh, yeah, it's commonly used as uh, it's a Māori greeting. Um, okay. But, yeah. I have never heard it. And I noticed that you said it in the uh, in the email. So, uh, dear viewers, I haven't met Tanya for very long. We met only very recently, a week ago or so. Um, if the two of you allow me, I will say a very brief thing uh, introducing you two to my audience. And uh, I'm very happy if you afterwards compliment it and introduce yourself also. So the easier part for me in the sense of the person I've known very long is Peter, of course, Peter Foster, uh, whom I've known for almost three decades, I guess it is. Um, uh, as, as a Reiki practitioner, we've been in contact. Um, Peter has made wonderful Reiki music. He's a musician. That's what he's describing himself biographically. But um, he is much more. I mean, he masters a, quite a number of instruments and he even builds them. I'm sure we will hear some uh, of his activities later on. But to me, quite frankly, is also somewhat, <clears throat> and this may surprise you, Peter, somewhat of a spiritual guide, if I may say, because your music is actually part and parcel of every one of my Reiki seminars for the last 30 years. So uh, all our 10,000 or so Reiki students in the seminar, they've actually uh, been accompanied by you. So that's why I take the liberty of describing you also as somewhat of a spiritual guide. And then we have Tanya. And uh, Tanya Pat, uh, if I look at her biography, I see she's a storyteller, an educator, a gardener, a collaborator, an author. And um, she is obviously also uh, in some liaison with Peter. And we are, I'm wanting to learn more about it. How did you two guys, maybe Tanya, meet first? And what is it you would like to add to your biography? We met because um, Tanya's, uh, she works with a, a musician in her storytelling and the previous musician had up and left for a, a Czech woman in Czechoslovakia, Czech, Czech Republic, I should say. And um, yeah, so Tanya was looking for a new, a new musician to uh, perform with. And Pete and I sh share an island, which is Waiheke Island, which is just off the coast of Auckland. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you familiar with um, Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, in fact, we're waiting on a cyclone as we talk to you tonight. We are. The rain's going to start any minute and the wind and stuff. <laughs> so, well, are, are you owning the whole island? It sounded like you're... <laughs> <laughs> I know. Just, no, there's no. about 9,000 people living 9,000 people we share it with. But uh, it's a pretty nice island. All right. And... Uh, <laughs> And we met because um, Tanya was interested in doing a storytelling piece around um, death and dying, uh, stories around that subject. And um, I'd been interested in doing music, possibly doing music to assist people with the dying process. So we had that in common. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's how we first met and got together. Yeah. We actually knew each other for several years. Yeah. I mean, we met 20 years ago. Yeah, that's yeah. right. But uh, through the process of meeting and rehearsing mm. uh, and creating uh, this piece, we developed a professional work, uh, relate, working relationship, a creative relationship, and, uh, a, you know, a personal mm. relationship as well. Yeah, and we since got married. Yeah. So, so till death do you part, and 
<laughs> death brings you together too. Yes, yes. Well, it, it's interesting because uh, I understood from the previous conversation we had that the project uh, to be or not to be, uh, which is the, the death and, and birth um, uh, theme, um, I had understood this was a more recent development where you also got an award. And if I look at your work online, I see a lot of, um, you know, almost um, I saw some mythological tellings, but but it was addressed almost to children. And um, this uh, death and dying and birth, they sound not necessarily the topics for children. So I had uh, noted that down to be to be to be discussed with you and you mentioned it so let's start with that that's fine by me tell me a little bit more about that award you won and what what is this story all about this work you've done describe it a little bit please well we started working on it when we first met eight eight years ago and um but it started before then it's for me yeah but but then we sort of laid it aside and just put it to one side it wasn't it wasn't finished and then when we came to lockdowns with covid we suddenly thought right this is the time to finish it so that's what happened we finished it during yeah. the lockdowns because we couldn't be touring mm. we were at home like the rest of the world mm. but toby uh, the young boy that the piece takes its title from which is a little play in english on words was my neighbor well, I live full time on an eco village here on Waiheke Island, and Pete's mm. a part time resident. Mm. Yeah, was my neighbour, and he was a four year old boy at the time. He's fourteen now, and the concept of the piece evolved from a series of conversations I had with him, where he I was a witness to his cognizance of his mortality, uh, and his uh, our story, our relationship. The connection that Toby and I had is woven through uh, the piece, mm. that piece that Pete creates, various pieces of music and plays several different instruments in, uh, along with traditional stories from different wisdom traditions from different cultures around the world, because all humans tell stories about death and dying, because it's something we all have to do. Mm. Yes, and I, uh, you know, when I said earlier, uh, stories are being told to children, and and I see uh, online that you're uh, almost addressing, but but if I listen to the content, uh, very often uh, it's a story for grown-ups. Actually, it almost appears to me <laughs> talking to the children is an ally by to get the mass message across. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it a, is it's it a, is an adult storytelling piece. largely because of its length as a performance piece. It's nearly an, an hour and a half long, which even for many adults to sustain attention on an audible piece is is quite a quite an achievement. A lot of people have a lot of anxiety about discussing death with children, but my experience is that children are naturally quite inquisitive and quite insightful. Take let's, con <laughs> let's continue in a moment on that and uh, it's very interesting and very important what you are about to say i'd like to uh, in terms of introducing you i've prepared a little video which i'd like to show you and the uh and the um, audience just uh, let's have a look at this together Kiara, i'm tanya bat and i'm peter forster and this time last year we were both in the UK, taking part at Festival at the Edge. Yeah. Today, um, we're coming to you from our home on Waiheke Island in the Hauraki Gulf in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And it's the middle of our winter. And so we're sending a story from the far north, from Finland, to the middle of your summer. And maybe this story says something about the kind of stories that arise when you have very long, dark, Winters. Once upon a time on the edge of the forest, in a small house there lived three friends, a squirrel, a glove and a needle. And one day the three of them decided to go hunting and so off they set, squirrel at the front, glove in the middle and needle behind. Squirrel went bounce bounce, glove went wave wave, needle went so so. Went, wave, wave, needle went so, so. 
<laughs> it's weird I, watching you. Say. <laughs> I'm sure I wanted to ask you how is it for you to watch, but mainly I wanted to show my audience what you people are doing. I mean, storytelling, uh, music and songs. Uh, it's difficult to, 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 to get the grasp. So and this also shows where you're coming from. Uh, though it was made uh, in a uh, in winter, I think. Uh, uh, anyhow, it was the other way around than it is now. It's winter in Europe and then summer in New Zealand for you. So how, how was this, Peter, for you to, to see you... Um, uh, being uh, uh, on screen and accompanying your partner? <laughs> it's kind of cool. I, I looked a bit thinner and <laughs> and younger, so... <laughs> Memories! Yes. Yeah, that's right. And for you, Tanya? Oh, well, I mean, this is something I've been doing for 30 years now. And while the whole digital realm is a relatively new area of exploration brought largely to, upon us because of COVID, um, you know, I've kind of generally moved through um, my discomfort of self-consciousness of seeing myself and listening to myself. I did used to have a similar sort of reaction. Mm. Yeah. Well, actually, I, uh, I was interviewed by uh, a, a French uh, channel and I got the video yesterday of the video with me and I had to look at it and I had to look at myself uh, answering questions. And don't tell anybody, but a little bit fell in love with myself. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there isn't only the embarrassment and the, sh and the feeling awkward, uh, it's sometimes also quite, uh, yeah, I, I think it's enjoyable to see your own work uh, being done. Yeah, it is. It is. I guess one of the things for me that I love about storytelling is the ephemeral nature of it. It's something that happens in a moment uh, and it's, it's pretty prop free. It's, you know, mm. me audibly you know telling a story and keep um creating music to go with it and with this whole new you know realm of you know doing what we're able to do this evening which is wonderful because you know we can connect with people in lots of different places but we also capture things um and i have real mixed feelings about the capturing of performances but we that particular recording was for a festival in the uk that was happening during covid so we'd made that recording well oh. this this brings up the question why tell stories and i'm honestly flabbergasted um uh, when i did a little bit of research you're soon to appear at the mumbai international storytelling festival i know oh, you have uh, you, it, sorry last week we did that oh i, I see and uh, <laughs> i know that you're uh, you're supposed to have engagements in japan uh, you refer to Finland. I, I never knew there is a, an international a conspiracy of storytellers. Why, why is that? And, and what is this community, the storytelling community? And why tell stories in the first place? Yeah, I guess it's, I had no idea there was such a Reiki community. So there's all these interesting little pockets uh, in our world, isn't there, of people who come together with a shared interest. Humans have been telling stories for thousands of years. It's one of the things that I, I love about the tradition is that when you tell a story, you step into a continuum. Um, of course, the way that we tell stories has changed, but you actually can't get away from the good old fashioned sharing of narrative. And it doesn't really matter what language you speak or what culture you come from. Every, every human who's ever lived has told stories. We have our our cultural stories, our mythologies, our folk tales. But as humans, we're, we're a narrative being and we make sense of the world through the stories that we tell. Even when we're asleep, we are dreaming in narrative, albeit a little bit um, sometimes weird and wonderful, the dream world. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and the uh, uh, interesting point, this... Uh, this uh, where you are moving away from reality into the dream world with stories, with fairy tales, 
Uh, and of course, and it's interesting, you mentioned tradition and you mentioned uh, Reiki. And in our tradition, the oral uh, telling of the stories is very important. And quite frankly, when I give a public talk on Reiki, um, I get up there and I tell stories. <clears throat> case stories, uh, how Reiki can work, my own story, uh, how I got into it. And I think that um, those narratives are in a way more telling and more important than any scientific study and any PowerPoint presentation I might uh, offer to my audience. And then there is music, of course, uh, you know, the, 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 the global language, uh, Peter, um, uh, how was it for you when I described you as a spiritual guide through all these seminars? How did you feel? Um, I feel a little bit of that. I've, ever since I've been making music, especially music for Reiki, and I have had a strong sense that this is, this is something that's just magic. And it's just, I don't know, and it's, it's something I've got to share. So, yeah, I feel, I feel good about it. I think we're both people who are passionate about sound. And when you think about the uh, sense of sound, it's the first thing that evolves uh, when we're growing in our mother's womb. And it is the last sense that we lose when we're departing um, this world, our physical body as well. Mm. So, you know, in our own ways, I mean, there's even a greater universality about music, um, storytelling, I've listened to stories in languages that, you know, I don't, I'm sadly very monolinguistic. It's a bit of a, uh, you know, something that happens when you live on a little island right down in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> but, um, you know, when, when someone tells a story that you know in a language you don't know, often because a story is more than um, just words being spoken, it's a rhythm and a cadence. Um, it's it's and it's like I'm doing at the moment, my body moving and expressing, but I certainly think there's a greater accessibility to mm. with music. And music has an energy that that just comes through and it's hard to describe. I mean, but it's something that we all understand. We all we all sense that the vibration, because I believe on the deepest level we're all we're all vibration and Music just taps into the different levels of vibration. Mm. You know, that's um, a friend of mine and a, and a Reiki person. He is a conductor, a, cl a classical musical, and he travels the world conducting big orchestras. And I know personally, I don't understand music. I don't r read music. Um, and when uh, he used to live in Lucerne and he was conducting here the local symphony orchestra, he often gave my wife and me free tickets to go to the concert. And I once spoke to him and I said, I really appreciate that, um, but I really know nothing about music. My only um, measure of music and is how I respond to it. If music manages to give me goosebumps or... Um, um, gets me gets me emotional or, or even frightful you know sometimes I can choke <laughs> it can choke you then I know that there is a powerful thing present and there is something uh, great um, uh, transported which is also transported when stories are a metaphor or, or an analogy something else actually is being transported <clears throat> and he said and this connects to what you just said Peter that when uh, he is at his in a good form and his orchestra is in a good form and the audience is in a good form, something magical happens to him, which he visually sees that energy which you were referring to, Peter. Uh, he, he told me that he, he has a visual impression of that, which is, of course, for me, uh, quite you know amazing to hear. But I see both of you nodding. Uh, you can relate to this, can you? Yes, well, absolutely. We, and certainly, in this, uh, there's a metaphor in storytelling which talks about um, the experience of storytelling being like the three legged stool. And those three points on the stool are the storyteller, 
the person, the people or person that you're sharing the story with and the story itself. And that's a living, active, dynamic relationship. And just like, you know, your experience of resonating um, and having an emotional response to different music, it's the same for stories. Some stories people, you know, listen to and they have, you know, it instantly um you know taps them into some of their something of their own experience or something even deeper that um they might not consciously be able to mm. connect with but that's the power of metaphor really is that we're not our, our our conscious mind isn't preoccupied with detail and i think music can work in a very similar sort of way mm. we're operating at another level a deeper an often deeper level um yeah where that where that chattering mind isn't interfering with our ability to receive yeah and i, I love playing music with with tanya stories because it's sometimes we get into the zone and you just kind of ride and, and the music just comes out of me and just comes and flows and i didn't know what i was going to do but something happens and and it's just magic when those moments happen where it all kind of just flows and comes together yeah just like your conductor friend there yeah. are real moments and for me the music really helps me lean into the story mm. it's uh yeah it really holds it holds so they're mutually uh, inseminating each other they're mutually um, making each other grow it's a it's a true synergy and i'm sure it, that works better some days and not so well yeah. in other days, I yeah, assume. Yeah. That's true. Just depending on how <laughs> you're feeling, how your audience is feeling, you know, yeah. all of those things uh, are part and, of the dynamics. And, and for you too, the feedback from the audience is like an input which lifts you. Can you feel that? Is that true even, even online? It's one of the things that I found quite challenging to get used to online. I really had to let go of the experience of storytelling being the experience when we tell stories in a shared space with other real human beings, uh, because you you don't have that energetic um, exchange. Mm. But once you've let go of it being that way and you accept that there is value uh in sharing stories digitally as well via these platforms you know well I mean, metaphysically speaking uh it doesn't really matter whether the audience sits in front it matters of course but uh what i'm trying to say is even if you're connected uh, to india or, or finland on the other side of or right now as we are disconnected we are disconnected uh, um, geographically and physically in terms of perception, but of course we are also energetically connected with each other. So even now um, we make each other laugh or think, and and there is there is uh, an exchange of energy. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm. And you know, like, well, all people who go out into the world publicly to to do their mahi to do their work. This time last year was the first time in two years that we had gone out to perform publicly. We toured the mm. South Island for two months with the um, piece that we were talking about earlier and another piece. And after two years of not not doing that. Yeah. And it was wonderful to actually mm. tell stories to real people again. Yeah, it, was. <laughs> it was. It was. It was really lovely, yeah. probably on all sorts of levels because it had been such a strange time. But uh, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, uh, to to look a little bit, focus a little bit on, on music, um, uh, you may remember this. Uh, it's a long time ago. Today, nobody has CDs anymore. <laughs> oh, what is that? <laughs> but but uh, the jackets uh, I, I still enjoy. And, and if I look at the jacket of uh, your, I think, first uh, Reiki um, uh, CD, and then it says... Peter Foster, classical guitar, steel string guitar, um, didgeridoo, synthesizer, pan pipes, wood flute, wind chimes, and some are built uh, by yourself. And I, I know that you recently also built the cello. Um, actually, 
why don't we just like listen for a moment into your music Yeah, uh, like with the story earlier in the video, I could have listened on and same thing here. Uh, but I wanted to give my audience a bit of a flavor of what you're doing. Um, so back to talking about it. And I'd like to, you're also building instruments, Peter, which to me is just fascinating. And uh, last time you told me that you built the cello, I even found the video where you're playing cello. And um, uh, Tell me a bit about that cello project um, you mentioned last time. Yeah, I've got a bit here, just by accident. <laughs> anyway, that's the that's the top of the cello. Um, yes. And it's quite a special cello. It's a special it's cello because from... of the... I decided not to use the traditional cello woods, which are um, maple and uh, European spruce, but rather to make it from a New Zealand tree called the Kauri tree, which is quite an endangered tree here in New Zealand because so many of them have been chopped down. And the only, the only timber you can get from these trees now is, is um, generally old recycled timber from old buildings that have been knocked down. And um, so that th this top that I showed you, it's made from um, pieces of timber out of of an old house that was knocked down so the tree was cut down 120 years ago and it's nice it really mature wood because <laughs> um yeah the oldest wood makes the best instruments so i've decided to make to make this cello out of, out of recycled wood basically and see how it sounds and it's been a long project many many years but i'm getting i'm getting close to the end now I know that uh, when I first met you in person, I know that you had, oh, and this is more than 20 years ago, uh, you had your guitar with you, uh, which you had built also yourself then, back then. That's right. Yeah, I've made a few guitars. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm really excited about this project, mm. though, because yeah. <laughs> we've agreed that when it's almost like a story in itself that when Pete has completed the cello, we're going to create a storytelling piece that not only tells the story of Pete creating the cello, but tells the story of the Kauri tree yeah. here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so it feels like it's going to be a really special project. It does, actually. I'm, quite, I'm really excited about it. And the cello is just such an amazing instrument because for me, of all the instruments, it has a quality that is like the human voice. Mm. Totally. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's get back to that uh, where you started and uh, I then transgressed and got you to talk about all kinds of things. Let's get back to uh, Toby and uh, and um, uh, Toby or not to be a nice game of words. Um, it, it, tell me a little bit more about that and why is it? I think we gathered why it is important to tell stories. Why oral tradition has a value. Uh, and I don't see that in competition with uh, written records. And, they are substituting each other. They're complementary with each other. They're not in competition. Um, so we understand that the story about uh, the, the importance and the value of storytelling and of music, obviously, most people know. But now you're telling stories and you have this, um, this work and the, the award you won for it on the topic of... Um, uh, of death and uh, and dying and, and birth, uh, presumably. 
Um, tell me a little bit why this is important. Why also in connection with children? I get it that they have a more free and a less inhibited approach even to those topics than we think. We grown-ups often think of children. I get that. But still, why, why is it important to talk to children? Uh, and why is it important to talk about those things? Aren't they morbid uh, for many of us? I think it's important to talk to children about all kinds of things that are interesting for them. I think the important thing is for us not to develop ideas about what we shouldn't talk to children about. Um, I think for me, what I see in the world around me is a lot of anxiety in adults around death and dying. In fact, you know, there's been all sorts of things written about how death phobic society at a personal level in terms of our own human deaths, but also at an economic level, what's actually happening to our planet at the moment. <laughs> there's, there's lots of different Excuse explorations me. of, you know, the experience of, of death and dying and its value. And ironically, I, I do believe that when we engage deeply um, with um, our, our fears uh, around death and dying, we actually can live fuller lives. Um, that That is the kind of the irony of something that we naturally feel inclined to, to push away. So I just think to normalize conversations around death and dying, you know, people have a similar kind of anxiety about talking to children about sex and sexuality. Yes. You know, by being humans, you know, we, we become to be human through a sexual experience and by being human, we're going to have to die as well. So these are very normal and sacred and ordinary parts of being human. So I, for me, it's about <coughs> embracing those opportunities <coughs> Sorry. when they arise. Do you want some water? Yeah, I've got Here you go. So, um, <laughs> yeah, these conversations I had with Toby, they weren't contrived. They just naturally came up. Uh, in, in our relationship through, you know, in, in conversation. And I just, you know, I didn't kind of push the situation and I just continued to respond to his curiosity. And because I work with stories, my natural inclination was to have those conversations sometimes through picture books, as, as you said before. I don't kind of privilege one over the other. I think they're both really valuable forms of storytelling and through, through telling stories. And I... After having that experience, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we all had those opportunities to to talk about death and dying? Not necessarily just because someone we know or our, ourselves are going actively through that process of dying, but just just you know, in, in everyday life. Because I feel like there's such a lot of richness and opportunity to be had from those experiences. Yeah, I fully agree with you. It's very life affirming to actually mm -hmm. speak about these things and become conscious of it. And mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't wait until we're sick and old uh, with this conversation. Uh, it's very important. Um, how, Peter, um, I never in your music, I never um, consciously perceived that the topic of dying and death was in the forefront. So this project has brought it to the surface or to the forefront also musically for you. Can you tell us a bit about uh, about that? I, I guess it has, though I still feel like I haven't achieved that that goal I had 15, 20 years ago to make to make music that people could actually die with, that they, they you could play this music when people were in the process of passing away. Um, I've since had the experience of a, a couple of times of playing music to people who were who were in the very last stages of life, and uh, it's been very profound. Mm. And I may yet still create a, a piece of uh, an album or a, a, some music for that specifically. And I think actually by doing this project, it's actually <coughs> brought us into contact with communities who. We've met at the choir who sing to people. Mm. Um, I, was, 
I so, want to hear a bit more from you, Peter, about this, because uh, last June I was at the conference in Vienna, a Reiki conference, and there was a very, very, not a Reiki person, a, uh, a doctor, uh, very, very impressive. And he actually documented the impact in the dying process. And he even showed us videos exclusively and very dignified, very, very correctly. He showed us videos of dying process accompanied with, uh, with music. So I, very, I want you, Peter, to say when you were there, when you had the opportunity, uh, and, and, and how did you play? Was it, was it just, just improvisation? Did you, what, what, and how, how was that for you? I'd like you to expand on that just a little bit, if, you, if you're willing to, please. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think both times I used a, um, I was just playing the flute, and it was totally improvised, and just just playing whatever whatever comes. So it seemed like a very a lovely thing to do, and I think I will do more of it. I know I know that there are there are many in in America. There are people who play harps to dying people, and that's quite a well recognized thing called music thanatology, and. Um, there are other schools of, of thought around music, but I, I think you can just go with your, your intuition and your feeling for whatever is appropriate at the time. Mm. Obviously, you know, obviously heavy metal wouldn't be, might not be the thing <laughs> unless it was my brother, you know, he was, he was into heavy metal. Well, actually, you know, it's funny you should say that because uh, one of the things this, uh, this, uh, this doctor said, and they studied, he studied this for a long time. Uh, and um, he, he, he introduced it in a number, a number of hospices and, and, and old age homes and hospitals, I don't know. Um, uh, and one of the things he said was very often, often the tunes from childhood, they have the most profound effect on people. So it can be a folk song or a children's uh, song for that matter. Um, and okay, I get it what you say about heavy metal, but today the children are maybe not growing up anymore with, uh, with folk songs and children's songs in, in that uh, charming way we all think of. Uh, so who knows, maybe in generations to come, um, there, will be, there, there will be more studies, but certainly if that doctor was privy to our conversation now, he would mm. very much encourage you, Peter, to expand on that. That's, after all, the dying process next to the birth process is probably the most important moment of our lives. Mm. <laughs> so to, to, to have music uh, in that process, um, my wife had a, a little play box uh, which she played before birth even to our children and it was present during birth, uh, uh, recognizing how important that is. And this, why shouldn't the same thing be true in the dying phase of our lives, of course it must be. Mm. I totally agree, and it goes back to what you what you were saying: how sound is the last thing to go. They've studied, mm. and I just I believe we we ride out on the waves of 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 vibration of music, and uh, they've always they've always thought you know heavenly angels are singing when you, when you get to heaven, but I, I really feel like that's true. And there's lots of, uh, the Hindu mythology springs to mind, but it, it's there in other uh, mythologies of other cultures as well, that, you know, the universe started with the sound. And in, in the Hindu mythology, that sound is the sound of, of Om. Mm. But I'm thinking about Lloyd Cannon as well. Because of COVID, we did we did something quite back to front. We often make recordings and albums of our our material, but usually after we've performed that material for a while. But with the to be or not to be, we actually made the album first, and we approached a um, an audio engineer, a sound engineer here on the island who had an, a wonderful reputation. He'd done all kinds of incredible. He was great audio engineering to work with us to record this album we didn't know when we um, asked him to work with us that he was in the process of dying 
Um, so not only was it incredibly generous, because this was the last project that he ever did, um, was this collection of stories around death and dying, um, but it was really profound for him to work with that material mm. uh, in you know the last few months of of his life. And one of the lovely things, well, not only was it lovely to share that material with Lloyd, but you know in the in the later celebration of his life after he actually died. We are actually able to go and and share some of that material mm. at his at his funeral. So. That's right. Mm. Well, that's wonderful, and uh, we're coming to the end of our conversation. And you know, you said celebration of life, mm. um, and in fact, uh, two months ago, I was invited to a celebration uh, after a funeral. Um, the lady uh, was uh, buried um, two weeks earlier. And it was her explicit wish that the people would meet for a celebration of life. And it was <laughs> one of the most wonderful parties I had gone to in a long, long time. And of course, music is always an important part in a celebration. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. All right. Um, the last words of wisdom from you wonderful people um, <laughs> <laughs> towards the, the end of our conversation. <laughs> Live a happy life with lots of music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's and certainly laughter. wonderful to have a creative professional relationship, our story and our song, mm. um, as well as a personal relationship. It gives a great richness to our it Our does. personal relationship, yeah. Generally. Generally. <laughs> <laughs> I find this, what you just said, so valuable and important because part of um, this talk show is to inspire people and to show them maybe what's possible. Uh, sometimes uh, I'm having very heavy topics, even like abuse, but at the end of the day, the topic may... or Death for many people is a very heavy topic, but at the end of the day, the life affirming and also the achievement affirming, what wonderful things we have achieved, like you just said, in your uh, relationship, your creative relationship, uh, and it's, it's, we can sense it, uh, we the audience on this side can sense that the two of you are, are creating a very self-determined life for yourselves. And they, congratulate you on that great yeah thank you yeah we've been lucky we're we're so lucky yeah i'm not sure yeah. luck has anything to do with it but that's maybe the topic of another <laughs> conversation <laughs> it is. it's counting your blessings and <laughs> yeah yeah well isn't that lovely is there that lovely saying isn't it that um you know all, all spiritual awakening is accidental and the purpose of life is to become more accident prone <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Me too. And I think that's a wonderful closing word. Thank you very much to the two of you for having joined me today. Uh, I wish you a nice evening. My day is just starting. Uh, Peter, Tanya, bye-bye to the two of you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Rene. See you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having watched. I hope you will watch again in three weeks' time. And uh, please remember to recommend us, subscribe. Bye-bye.